All right, so we're gonna try and go through the um, energy systems for nutrition. And so the first thing we're gonna start off with, we're gonna start off with glycolysis, okay? This is essentially when we take glucose and we're going to break it down into two pyruvic acids. So I'm gonna write pyruvic acid. And it's the same thing as pyruvate essentially. And so when you see that, pyruvic acid and pyruvate will be using those interchangeably. Same thing with lactate and lactic acid. Now understand this process is a 10 step process. What else do we have to know about glycolysis? It is anaerobic, it does not use oxygen. <clears throat> what else do we wanna know? It takes place in the cytosol. Cytosol is what? It's the fluid portion inside the cell. The other steps for energy systems are gonna take place in the mitochondria, okay? So this is taking place in the cytosol. All right, now in 10 steps, we get to two pyruvic acids. And <clears throat> essentially what's going to happen is we're generating ATP, all right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create boxes. We'll make red boxes, okay? We'll make red, hey, get out of there. We'll make red boxes and put the products of each of the steps that we go through, all right? So, so far we got two, let me see, let me do that in blue, I guess. I'll make the box red. Let's try that, that'll be clearer, okay? So we're gonna say we have two pyruvic acids, okay, that we created here. We also are going to generate two of these things called NADH, and then we're gonna generate two ATP. Now, when you look at the ATP, this is the net gain, but that is the only thing I'm ever gonna ask you is the net, because here's what happens. If you look at glycolysis, it actually, this whole process to go from glucose to pyruvic acid uses two ATP and we generate four. But really, what are we getting? We're getting two. So that's what I want you to focus on. I'm never gonna ask you about the two that we use um, and how we get a, a gross of four, but that's really a net of two, right? Because we use two. I mean, if I give you, um, if I if I give you two dollars to get four back, I got four. I got two dollars, right? And that's what we're looking at with this ATP. So here's our products from glycolysis: two pyruvic acids, two NADH, and two ATP. Now here's what you have to understand: these pyruvates, if we do not have oxygen available, the rest of the the processes for energy that we're going to use, okay. The rest of the processes we're gonna use are going to be in the mitochondria and they are aerobic. It's part of aerobic respiration. So even though not every part of the process or each process uses oxygen, it's necessary for um, the next three steps to take place, okay? So, but if we don't have oxygen, so let's go like this, oxygen is not available. Now this means we don't use oxygen here. We don't need it for glycolysis. We're always gonna do glycolysis without oxygen because it's an, it's an anaerobic process. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna take these pyruvic acids, they're going to convert into two lactates or two, let's make a two there, lactic acids, okay? That's if we don't have oxygen. If we have oxygen, we're going, we're moving on into what's called the intermediate step. But if we don't, we have these lactic acids and we're gonna to have to move that through what's called the Cori cycle. So let me see if I can switch slides here. Let's just switch to a new slide, boop. Okay, so now we have something. So we're gonna take the pyruvic acid. So we'll go to pyruvic acid. This is in the absence of oxygen, right? Two pyruvic acid. And we're gonna convert, they're gonna convert. That's a terrible arrow. We're gonna convert that to two lactic, spelling Dr. Lamana, lactic acids. Okay, now what do we gotta do? We're gonna take this lactic acid, we're going to put it, this is gonna be the Cori cycle now, so I'm gonna write this down, Cori cycle, okay. Now some of this stuff is in your slides, but I wanted, this is what I usually cover on the board, so you can look at these processes on your slides adjunctive to this video, okay? But I wanna do exactly how I teach it in class, and this is exactly how I do it. Now the Cori cycle is essentially this, whoops. The Cori cycle is, taking this lactic acid, shipping it to the liver, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna convert, in the liver, we're gonna convert lactic, I'm gonna abbreviate this, okay? We're gonna convert lactic acid back into pyruvic acid, and then that is gonna get converted, let's just go like this, 
it's going to get converted back to glucose. So this is happening in the liver. So we took the lactic acid in the muscle, we shipped it to the liver, we converted the lactic acid back to pyruvic acid, and then we converted that to glucose. That is the Cori cycle. Make sure you know that as well. Why is that happening? Well, we've got to get our glucose re uh, replenished, get it back, okay? By the way, this process here, this whole process, that costs us six, whoops, six ATP. Yikes. That's not really efficient, right? Because we got two ATP when we broke down the glucose. It costs us six ATP to convert it back to glucose. But the beautiful thing about this is we have uh, aerobic processes that I'm about to cover. And those aerobic processes, they are going to produce lots of ATP, okay? And those, uh, that ATP we use to pay down that debt so we can convert that stuff back. So we have something called the intermediate step. Intermediate um, step. It's also called a transitional phase. And um, it, sometimes this is intermediate phase, but intermediate doesn't really matter. And then uh, preparatory step, okay? These are all different names for it. Preparatory, I can't even spell this stuff, huh? Preparatory step. If I write sloppy enough, you can't tell. All right, so this intermediate step. What happens in this intermediate step? Very important stuff here, okay? In the intermediate step, we're taking the two, I'm gonna, I'm, just, I'm gonna start calling them pyruvates because I told you that we're gonna use those terms interchangeably, right? The two pyruvic acids are our two pyruvates. I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna convert it to, to acetyl coas okay? Now again, if you can't read my writing, I have this stuff in your slides, okay? You can go back and look at that. But I wanna go through this process because I wanna explain all this. I got some explaining to do, right? So we're gonna take the two pyruvates, we're gonna to convert to acetyl coa. Now here's, here's what's important, uh, a couple things. This is a three carbon molecule. This is a two carbon molecule, okay? That means this process is irreversible. Once we convert the pyruvates to the acetyl coa, we cannot go backwards. What do we see over here, okay? We saw, let's erase some of this, okay? Let's get some of this nonsense out of the way. So what's happening is, um, what I want you to understand here is that my um, pyruvate, let's do this, pyruvate is three carbon, and my lactate is three carbon. Okay, so let's do that. Okay, get out of the way thing. Here we go. So that's a reversible process, right? We saw that we could turn pyruvate into lactate or pyruvic acid into lactic acid. We also saw with the Cori cycle, we can do this, whoop, and convert it back, okay? Back to where we were. Now, this is not reversible, okay? Because we're actually losing a carbon through, uh, the carbon dioxide gets released in here. I don't care about that for testing purposes, by the way. I'll just write it because it's consistent with your slides, but I don't care. That's not a product, that's a, that's a, that's a waste product. So that's not a, a product that I'm using. So when I talk about my red boxes, which we're gonna make a red box here, and the stuff that we make, okay? we're talking about the things that we're gonna use. So what do we make? We made two acetyl <clears throat> coas, and we made two of these things called NADH. Again, I'm gonna talk about what we're doing with that later. Okay, what I also want you to know about this step, and by the way, all of these steps, B12 is found in none of these processes, okay? Um, you do require B1, B2, B3, B5, and something called lipoic acid for this process to take place. B1 is thiamine, B2 riboflavin, B3 niacin, B5 pantothenic acid, and then lipoic acid. You do not need to know the names, but just know B1, 2, 3, 5, lipoic acid is necessary for that to happen, okay? Again, no B12, all right? We talked about how B12 doesn't give you energy. It's not even involved in energy systems, okay? So we've got our acetyl coas now. Now we're able to go into the next step, which is going to be the Krebs cycle. And so let me add a slide here so we could just do that. Let's go. Um, all right, let's do this. Let's go Krebs cycle up here. Krebs cycle. Uh, that is super sloppy. It's, that's almost too sloppy for words. Okay, let's try it again. Krebs cycle. So we go here. Cool. 
The Krebs cycle, it's also called the TCA cycle, which is the tricarboxylic acid cycle. Oops, I didn't mean to cross that out, <laughs> but let's get rid of it. TCA cycle. Okay, so let me, let me do that a little better. TCA cycle. There's another name for it. It is called the citric acid cycle. Uh, I'm probably going to call it Krebs, but be aware of these names as well, okay, if you do see them. And I could use them, but I usually call it just Krebs cycle. All right, those are just other names for the same thing. Now, you see this, this wheel. If you look at the, the slides, I don't have them up here. But if you look on your slides, you can see, I call it a wheel, but it's basically a bunch of products. I'm converting one product into the next product into the next product, okay? Now... What I, want, what I want you to understand about Krebs cycle, again, is what are the products that we're going to make, okay? Now, what do we need? This is the way I look at it. We need, um, let's write this down in blue, I guess. We need an acetyl-CoA, oops, acetyl, which we made in the intermediate step. By the way, this is also in the mitochondria. This is also, right? This is a part of our aerobic respiration. The intermediate step was as well. So this is acetyl-CoA. We have two of these, right? Didn't we have two? Because we got, from one glucose, we got two pyruvic acids, which we made two acetyl-CoAs from. Every one acetyl-CoA is gonna turn through the Krebs cycle once, okay? And so that's how we move and, and we go from, now I don't want you to memorize all of the products that we make from one to the other, to the other, to the other, nor do I want you to memorize the enzymes that help that modulate that process in between each of these products, okay? Or reactants, we'll call them, okay? <clears throat> what I want you to understand is what are we making in this process? So we're gonna make our little red box again because I want, and it, again, it's, it's best, I don't have it here because I can't have them both up at the same time, but if, we, if you look, again, I don't care about the names for our purposes. What I care about is what we're making, all right? And so what you're gonna see is that when I go around the Krebs cycle once, I get three NADH. So if you follow and look at all the NADHs as we go around, so if you're looking at your picture, you'll see three NADHs come out of that cycle. You will also see one ATP come out of that cycle. You will also see this thing called FADH2. Two, okay, you'll see one of those come out of that cycle. In fact, I'm gonna change this, um, well, I'll, I'll make another red box, okay? But this is one turn through the Krebs cycle, all right? So let me erase some stuff here so I can kind of write a bit more, all right? So what is this? What are we doing here with this box? In fact, I'm gonna make this box a different color just so that we don't get confused because we're memorizing what we're doing from one glucose in a box. What is this actually from? This is actually from one turn through the Krebs cycle. So my question for you is, how many times are we going through the Krebs cycle? Well, we have two acetyl-CoAs, and every one acetyl-CoA goes around the Krebs, we go through this Krebs cycle once. So that means we're gonna go through from one glucose, we get two pyruvic acids, which generates two acetyl-CoAs, which will go around the Krebs cycle two times. Now I can ask, this, one, this question right here would be, what products do we get from one turn through the Krebs cycle or one cycle? of the Krebs cycle, something along those lines, I would say something like that. And then you would say three NADH, one ATP, one FADH2. That's a D, not an O, okay? All right, so let's move this out of the way. Let's get some of this stuff out of the way so I can make my red box. Now the red box is talking about what do we get from glucose. Now memorize this purple box. That's one turn through the Krebs cycle. I'm never gonna ask you, hey, how many, what do we get from two turns to the Krebs cycle. I'm not gonna ask that, you know why? You need to know you're going through the Krebs cycle twice for every one glucose. You need to know that automatically, okay? And that's why we're going over it. All right, so what do we get? We got six NADHs, right? Because it's tw two, we got two ATPs and we got two FADH2s, all right? So this is where we're at so far. Are you with me? I hope you're with me, all right. So, this is uh, from one glucose, right? So from one glucose, the Krebs cycle produces this, this red box, all right? That's pretty much what I want you to know from the Krebs cycle, all that stuff that I just went through. What do we get from one turn, two turns, how do we turn it, how do we start it or whatever, we need this acetyl-CoA to do it. 
and um, we go from there, all right? Now, uh, let's go ahead and sort of sum up where we're at so far, okay? Uh, let's make it a different color box so we don't get anybody confused. We'll just make a green box. And this green box is going to be like, hey, so far, dot, 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 so far, what have we done? Okay, what do we have? All right. So far, what we have, let's talk about it. How many pyruvase do we have? Zero. You know why? Because we use them. How many acetylcholase do we have? Zero, because we use them. So what do I have? I have 10 NADHs. Dr. Lamana, where'd you get those 10? I got six from the Krebs cycle. I got two from the intermediate step. And I got two from glycolysis, right? And by the way, you can't do the aerobic respiration without glycolysis. So I'm always going to include those together, by the way. Two FADHs, those came solely from my Krebs cycle. And how many ATP did I make so far? Just four, right? This is where I'm at so far. I got four ATPs, two from the uh, glycolysis, two from the Krebs cycle, and then I already mentioned where these guys came from. This is where we're at. At the end of the Krebs cycle, here's what we got, okay? Let me throw a new, another new slide in here, ba-boom. Okay, now let's talk about an exchange rate here, okay? And this is a great test question as well, so I'm gonna do it in even a different color, all right? I wanna know, NADH and FADH2, I want to know how much uh, ATP each one will generate, okay? Now, sometimes this is, uh, it's rounded up, and the rounding up, in my opinion, is completely wrong. So, we're not going to do that. We're going to be accurate. Every NADH is worth 2.5 ATP. Every FADH2 is worth 1.5 ATP. This is our exchange rate. This is a great test question as well. I may say, how many ATP do I get from an FADH2? Don't tell me two, tell me 1.5. We're not rounding these up. NADH is 2.5, not three. In fact, that's where we get um, numbers that are not accurate for human physiology. And so I'll go over some of those inaccuracies before we're done with this video. Okay, so we're done with this guy. All right, we're gonna take these NADH. Now we got, remember we had 10 of these and we had two of these. So let's go ahead and do, we're gonna go to the next step. All right. Um, I'm gonna need another slide. So let's go back to blue. We've got something called oxidative phosphorylation. Oxidative phosphorylation. And there's two parts of this. And don't worry about uh, my sloppy writing. Again, you have these words in your notes, in your, in your um, PowerPoint notes, which you're gonna study. Oxidative phosphorylation, we have Ele uh, I'm going to write it out, I guess. Electron transport chain. Transport chain. I have, I have nice pictures of this, so please reference your pictures uh, in your PowerPoints as well. Elec electron transport chain. We're going to Basically, what we're doing is we're using the electrons from the NADHs and the FADH2s, and we're going to pump hydrogen ions or pr these protons into the uh, intermembrane space of the mitochondria. I'll explain that in just a minute. So we have two steps to this oxidative phosphorylation. We've got electron transport chain, and then we've got something called chemiosmosis. All right, now let's do this. We're gonna make a mitochondria, okay? And you're like, Dr. Lamana, that looks like the bat signal out, you know, that we put into the clouds to call Batman. Possibly is. But really what this is is a mitochondria, and what you have is an inner membrane and an outer membrane. And this space in here is called the intermembrane space. So what we're doing is we're pumping hydrogens, okay, into the intermembrane space, all right? I really like to have them all up here, but I just don't have room. You can look at your picture for this. And so I'm pumping the hydrogen. So you got this, this, if you look at your picture, you got this chain of carriers and we're using the electrons and we're, and these proton carriers and we're pumping these protons into the intermembrane space here, okay? That part is the electron transport chain, all right? Chemiosmosis is when we take this device called ATP, so we're gonna point to here, ATP synthase, and you can see a nice picture of it in the PowerPoint slides. We're gonna take ATP synthase, and what we're going to do, let me erase some of this, okay. We're going to drop hydrogens through this device, these protons, 
and we're going to generate some ATP, okay? And so we need both of these processes. We need the electron transport chain to pump the hydrogen or protons into the intermembrane space, and we need the ATP synthase um, as we drop the hydrogen through this device that it's like a little spinning device, and it generates ATPs, all right? So what's our sum total? Well, let's get some of this stuff out of the way so we can make our red box again, okay? So we've got these two processes that are necessary. Again, if you're looking at the picture, this should make some sense. Don't get too hyper-focused on all the carriers. Again, this isn't biochemistry, but I do need you to really focus on how the process works, which I just covered, and what are we making, right? Because I'm really focused on the products, and you'll get a lot of questions from this chapter on, hey, what did we make? And so what did we make? Um, make a red box, and let's put, uh, let's make it blue, that I can write, whoops. And um, so what did I make? Well, let's write some stuff over here. I had 10 NADHs. What did I say my exchange rate was? 2.5 per NADH. So how many ATPs did I get? 25 ATP. Okay, I had two FADH2s. Uh, they were worth 1.5 each. So when I use this process here of oxidative phosphorylation, I generate three ATPs for a grand total of 28 ATP. My question for you is, what products do I make from oxidative phosphorylation? 28 ATP. How many of these do I make? None. How many of these do I make? None. I don't make anything else. I use the products now, and I put them through the electron transport chain, chemiosmosis, and I generate 28 ATP. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you something. I want, you, I want to explain something because, you know, when you take different classes, you'll see different numbers for some of this stuff. Now, we're not talking about microbiology with bacteria. You follow what your micro teacher says. Um, biology should be the same as this. My, uh, biochemistry should be the same as this. But sometimes textbooks kind of do a little cheapy and just round up. And let's, so let's, let's watch what happens if we round up. Okay, let's do a different slide. I need another one. So let's round up 10 NADHs. If we were to round that up to three, we end up with 30 ATP, which we don't. <laughs> but some textbooks will do this, especially nutrition and exercise physiology textbooks oftentimes do this. Um, sometimes biology instructors will teach it this way because their textbook also teaches it this way. Again, it's just kind of a cheapy way of rounding up. I don't, it's not going to work for my class. Do whatever your, other, whatever your instructor says for your class please do that, but I'm going to do the accurate numbers for my class consistent with true biochemistry. Um, now, again, what your textbook says we make about 30-ish ATP, but, and it's true because these systems are not perfect, but on my test, it's going to be perfect. It's going to be a perfect world, okay? Uh, otherwise, it's too hard to memorize all the variables of, okay, you're lacking a certain nutrient, so this process is not going to generate as much as it should. Okay, let's finish this. 2 FADH, if we rounded it up to 2, Per FADH, we end up with four. This is all incorrect, by the way, so we're putting a big X here. I don't like this. This is 34 ATP, okay? All right. Now, what you will see is you will see the number um, uh, 36, which is basically saying two from the Krebs cycle and 34 from here. That is an inaccurate number for us, for human physiology. Sometimes you'll see the number 38. That is taking the glycolysis plus the Krebs cycle plus this 34. But you see it's happening because we're overestimating the amount of ATP we make from these products. Let's go back here, okay? 2.5 ATP per NADH, 1.5 per FADH2. How many do we really get? Well, if it works perfectly, which we know it never works perfectly, but in my class, it does. On my world, my test, it does. So we're gonna end up with 28. Now, we still have something we have to do. Let's create a double, oh my gosh, a double red box. Oh my gosh, a double red box. How many ATP did we make from one? So ATP from one glucose. How many did we make? Think about it, how many? 32, right? You're like, where'd you get 32, bro? Okay, let's talk about it. We got two from glycolysis. We got two from the Krebs cycle. And then we took all those products and we used oxidative phosphorylation. We got, uh, sorry, 28. 
And so that gives me a grand total of 32, sorry, that should be ATP right there, 32 ATP, okay? Now, what I wanna, what I wanna emphasize here, let's get one more, which should be our last slide. Well, one more thing I wanna do. Okay, um, how many ATP in the absence of oxygen? Well, that's two ATP, right? Because we stop there and then we have to go through the Cori cycle as pyruvic acid gets converted to lactic acid. So in the absence, this is our word on a test, in the absence, um, let's get on the screen. In the absence of oxygen, I generate two ATP from one glucose. How many ATP do we get? Oh, that's a boop, 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 boop. Okay. How many ATP do we get when oxygen is present? Some of you are going to want to say 30. That is not correct, so don't say 30. 32 ATP. You say, well, Dr. Lamano, we generated three from the Krebs cycle. We generated 28 from the oxidative phosphorylation, which was the aerobic, aerobic respiration. I understand that, but you can't do this. You can't do aerobic respiration without glycolysis. So we're never, at least in my class, we're never separating glycolysis from the total system. So if I say from one glucose, how many ATP do we get? Let's write one glucose here as well, so we have it both. In the absence of oxygen, we get two. In the presence of oxygen, we get 32. Just because glycolysis doesn't use oxygen doesn't mean you don't have oxygen available to go through the next three steps, okay? So in the presence of oxygen, we make 32. Even though two is made anaerobically, doesn't matter. It's from one glucose. And then when we don't have oxygen, we only make two, all right? And that kind of sums up everything I want to cover there. Now, what I'm also going to just share with you is we have a number of slides that I'm not going to read to you. Okay, let's, let's see if I can... There we go. Let's make that minimize there. And so if you look at all these slides, this is in the supplemental slides, okay, um, the, the PowerPoint. I put them all together. These are also in the regular PowerPoints, okay, but... Um, I wanted to pull them out because these are these are slides that I have you guys study on your own, all right? Instead of because really what I would just be doing here is reading you everything on these slides, and so I'm not going to do that. Okay. The only thing I'm going to emphasize actually is when we get to these um, LDL, we want it to be under or equal to 100. Um, HDL, we, when it's above this, instead of saying good, we're going to say cardio protective text the heart. And then when it's less, instead of saying not good, we're going to say cardiovascular, that's CV, cardiovascular risk. And then I want you to know that uh, normal or to your normal total cholesterol is equal or less than 200. Don't worry about the milligrams per deciliter, okay? So these are the numbers, 200. Uh, good is, or, or cardioprotective is uh, 60. HDL is your good lipoprotein also known as your good cholesterol, even though it's not cholesterol, it's a lipoprotein, less than 40, cardiovascular risk. LDL is your bad cholesterol, quote unquote, which is technically a lipoprotein, and we want it to be equal or less than 100, ideally, okay? Those are the numbers I want you to memorize for that. Everything else, you're memorizing all of your numbers all the way through. There was one other thing, actually, let me just clarify here. Uh, this has changed from 1.2 to 2.0 grams per kilogram of body weight, okay? And the thing is, uh, this is not an RDA. Your RDA is 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. This is the recommendation for athletes, but we're also gonna say athletes also is defined as people that exercise regularly, okay? That's the same number, even though we know that that's not technically accurate. We know that, I'm just telling you what the number fulfills. The number fulfills a recommendation for people that work out regularly or athletes. That's 1.2 to 2.0 grams per kilogram of body weight. The RDA, though, is always going to be 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. All right. Um, this one, actually, all I really want you to know, in fact, I guess I will, maybe I will go through these. Uh, this is just read and memorize everything on there, read and memorize everything on here. I do have a memory cue for this one, though. So I guess I switched gears in the middle of this video. We're going to go through some of this. Trans fats will increase uh, the LDL, which is the bad lipoprotein or cholesterol. And it's gonna it's gonna decrease uh, the good one. Saturated fats will raise the bad and raise the total. 
Ma and so now trans fats are banned now, but I still want you to know the effects that they cause on the bl on blood lipids. Monounsaturateds are going to lower the bad, lower the total, raise the good. Polyunsaturateds will lower the bad and raise the good. And so make sure you memorize those. I also want you to memorize your two essential um, fatty acids. And um, I want you to know if they're omega-6 or 3. All right, linoleic and alpha-linolenic are the two essentials. That means you have to get them from your diet, just like essential amino acids. A memory cue for this, though, watch this. Linolenic, watch this. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. In the word linolenic, I have three sets of three letters, omega-3. Three. three sets of three. Lots of threes going on there, okay? Which means the linoleic is omega-6. Okay, so that's just a little memory cue so you can differentiate between the omega-6 versus the 3. On this one, I want you to know that there's um, 20 amino acids that make up protein. There's not 20 amino acids, okay? There's hundreds of amino acids, but 20 of them make up protein. And I want you to know that uh, 9 of them are essential. I don't care that you memorize all the names, okay? On this slide, um, I gave. this is what I want you to know, the numbers I showed you there. On this slide, everything, phenylketonuria. Um, everything on this slide. Um, B12 is the only one that stores as far as water-soluble vitamins, and um, A, D, and E store in the liver, these fat-soluble vitamins, but go ahead and memorize everything on here. A, D, E, and K are fat-soluble. B complex and Cs are water-soluble. Memorize metabolism, anabolism, and catabolism, all right, the, the definitions, and I would actually call this biochemical reactions. Uh, definition of glycogenesis, formation of glycogen, and glycogenolysis is the breakdown of glycogen. Um, these are the lipoproteins, okay? So your HDL is your good cholesterol. Um, I want you to know this bullet point that it transports cholesterol from tissues to liver, and LDLs is your bad cholesterol, and it transports cholesterol to peripheral tissues. This is the bad guy. VLDLs are mostly triglycerides and transport triglycerides from the liver to the tissues. And then chylomicrons, you've seen this guy, right? You saw it in my digestive chapter. That's a transport, right? We transport those long chain fatty acids into the lacteals to get it into the blood, all right? And last but not least, okay, I already went over those numbers for cholesterol. All right, so I skipped around a bit, but you've got it all on the video here. You also have these slides to go back and read and study. Um, the other PowerPoint presentation, okay, the other PowerPoint presentation, is, I want you to, um, for, for nutrition, I literally just want you to use the pictures to go along with the stuff that I went through here, like all of this type of stuff. Okay, so they're just adjunctive so you can see some visuals for all of these processes. If you have any questions, obviously let me know. This should wrap it up for the nutrition chapter. Anything that's not on these uh, slides, so the slides that are here, let's see how many are there, 13 to 23. So those basically 10 slides, let's see, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 11, is it 11 slides? And then, of course, all the stuff that I went over here. That's everything. Again, the pictures help you with some of these processes. If you look at oxidative phosphorylation, the electron transport chain, chemiosmosis, you know, that's going to be very helpful as well. All right, so that wraps up chapter 24. If you have any questions, let me know. Stay strong. I will see you next time.